Tennessee Capital Report is made possible in part by a grant from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Tennessee. Some games aren't played for glory. Some are played for more important reasons. That's why we partner with schools to re-energize physical education with Shape the State. With additional support from the following members of the Tennessee Credit Union League. Welcome to Tennessee Capital Report. I'm your host, Chip Hoback. The 110th General Assembly is running full speed now with over 1,400 bills filed by the February 9th deadline. But the work is just beginning with committees and subcommittees now meeting to sort through the legislative priorities for 2017. The state budget and transportation funding are perhaps the biggest issues facing this session. And on today's show, we'll hear different points of view from a number of legislators. First, we'll hear from the Republican leaders of both houses, Senator Mark Norris of Collierville and Representative Glenn Cassida of Franklin. Also weighing in on the issue, Representative David Hawk, Representative John Ray Clemens, and Senator Steve Dickerson. Also on the show today, a discussion on a resolution calling for a balanced budget amendment to the federal constitution with Senator Brian Kelsey and Representative Dennis Powers. We'll also be covering the fallout from Representative Mark Lovell's resignation. It's all ahead. But first, we'll look at Governor Haslam's transportation funding proposal as presented in his State of the State address a few weeks ago. With the IMPROVE Act, we're proposing to increase the gas tax seven cents and the diesel tax 12 cents per gallon. And all new revenue goes only to address our transportation needs. The, the legislation will mean 962 projects in all 95 counties, both urban and rural. It will also mean $78 million annually in increased revenue for counties and $39 million for cities. Joining me now is the Republican leader of the Senate, Senator Mark Norris. Welcome back to Tennessee Capital Report. Always good to have you on. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. All right. Of course, State of the State Address unleashed a lot of new uh, measures that the governor wants to implement. Uh, one of the biggest is the gas tax that everybody's talking about. We want to go through and talk about the IMPROVE Act and the different taxes that are going to be involved with the IMPROVE Act. Explain that to us. Mostly it? tax cuts. Mm -hmm. Mostly tax cuts. It's a tax swap. The IMPROVE Act, and I know people talk about the increase in the roads user fee, um, but we're in a situation now with revenues the last two years where the governor is trying hard to reallocate those revenues to maximize the return on the taxpayer's investment. He said several times, if, if we could write rebate checks, uh, we would, but fortunately we don't have an income tax, so we can't. So the question is, how would you do things differently to maximize the taxpayer's investment to return as much of that to them as possible? One way is by continuing to reduce the sales tax on food. Another way is to reduce the excise and franchise tax that keeps business away. Um, there's some some changes in the allocation of taxation here in the state that would further boost business, that boosts jobs and pay raises and the like. The gas tax component uh, has been, as you've heard, in place since the late 1980s. Um, 21.4 cents, which in today's dollars are worth about 11 cents because of fuel efficiency. Um, and a variety of things that have really eroded or inured to the taxpayer's benefit over many years. If you kept pace with inflation and cost of living, that 21.4 cents would probably be 39 cents today. So in the reallocation process, the administration has proposed that you increase as to the gas uh, 7 cents, take it up to 28.4 cents, be about 4 or 5 dollars a month. Uh, for the average taxpayer. I frame the issue a little differently than Governor Haslam does. Uh, he talks about economic development and backlogs. I talk about keeping Tennessee safe. I talk about public safety. We have 20,000 bridges uh, here in Tennessee, too many of which are dangerous. They're unsafe. 
and depending on which county I visit, when I tell folks, if you see a weight limit sign, that means that bridge has been posted. That sign wasn't put there when the bridge was first built, but it's now dangerous. There's a whole lot of backlog of projects like that that are, are being addressed, and that's, that's the good news, I think. There's several different proposals to address that. What are the differences between the proposals that you're hearing? Primarily, where does the money come from? Do we use the gas tax as a dedicated fund, or do we use the sales tax? Do we take funds from the sales tax rather than increase the gas tax? So the legislation I have filed doesn't prefer one over the other. It carries Governor Haslam's proposal, as well as those proposals that propose to take it from sales tax. The challenge you have with sales tax, and those of us who've been here long enough know, that it's not always there. It's not as reliable a revenue stream as many think it is. Sometimes the sales tax does not generate enough for us to meet our cost of operations. We remember that from the early 2000s. Our bond rating may be at risk, if we dip into the sales tax. It's not a dedicated fund, user fee like the gas tax. But I've said many times, if it's the General's Assembly to address it one way or another, um, you know, let the rough side drag. At least people seem to agree that we are in need of additional revenues for our infrastructure, one way or another. I've heard the governor speak on this several times and he views this as a user tax where people from out of state trucking companies that use the roads and make the roads deteriorate are the ones that are going to be paying this tax. Right. There, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. 40%, maybe as much as 50% is paid for by others from out of state. So his question is, why should we put 100% of the burden on Tennessee taxpayers? And it's, a, it's more than a fair question. I happen to be the legislator who has sponsored and successfully passed more tax cuts than any individual legislator in state history. Um, I, I sponsored the repeal of the gift tax. I sponsored the repeal of the death tax. I've sponsored the reductions in the sales tax on food. Over half a billion dollars worth of tax relief per year for Tennesseans. So I'm not in the least bit um, afraid to put this skunk on the table where Governor Haslam, on the one hand, proposes to raise the user fee. Um, it's nowhere near what I've cut in taxes. We'd still be ahead of the game. We'd still be the lowest tax state in the nation. That sounds like a campaign speech. Speaking of campaigns, uh, a couple of years left in the Haslam administration, and rumor has it that, that you may be throwing your hat in the ring. Where are you in that decision-making process as to whether or not you would do that? Well, I may well do that. I'm first and foremost committed to my responsibilities as the Senate Majority Leader right now. Um, there's plenty of time to make that determination after session, and um, it's, it's not a decision that anyone takes lightly, nor, nor should they. A lot of people, you know, they, they just haul off and run, and, and that's fine, but that's not, that's not my style. Thank you, Senator Norris. We appreciate you Thank taking you. the time to be on the show Always once again. You. Thank Always you. great to see you. Governor Haslam's IMPROVE Act has sparked a spirited debate on Capitol Hill regarding how Tennessee funds transportation projects. Let's hear what others are saying, beginning with Representative David Hawk. I think the governor's done a great job in uh, expressing the need for transportation funding. So what I did was basically go back to square one and say how can we better address our transportation funding without any new taxes. Um, we've had substantial growth in our budget over the last three years. We're recognizing 957 million new dollars of recurring revenue. So first blush, how can we live within our means and do something within those dollars? Um, as I studied that, I simply found what happens if what we can, if, what happens if we address um, and reallocate a quarter of 1% of general sales taxes from the existing revenue stream and put it to the highway fund. Um, simple as that. It creates $291 million that will go toward funding those transportation needs. There's a component that also funds county and city needs as well. 
my alternative is meant to provide some new creative alternatives to the governor's plan and hopefully be incorporated into his. Mine does not include a massive corporate manufacturing tax cut and mine does not include the grocery tax cut, which I think should be passed, but it should be passed in a standalone piece of legislation. The other signature piece of my legislation is the creation of a transportation services district, which basically includes all the Middle Tennessee RTA counties and allows our counties to benefit from our prosperity and our growth and use that money to reinvest it into our transportation infrastructure system to facilitate future growth, creating a cyclical effect where we're benefiting from our growth and reinvesting in it at the same time. And I also include enabling legislation similar to the governor's, but mine is much broader. I want to empower local governments and give them more flexibility to address the need to generate new revenue for transportation purposes by providing them a buffet of sorts and giving them a lot of options to increase local revenue rather than just putting it on the back of sales tax because I think compounding the regressive nature of our tax system in Tennessee puts a lot more weight on working people across the state and we don't need to limit it to that. We need to open it up and every county is different. We need to, they need to have options and be empowered to create revenue so they have some skin in the game as well. So the governor has his large act that includes all sorts of taxes, uh, the gas tax, it has a lot of tax relief, it also has a, a local option so that local um, counties like Davidson County and Ridley Middle Tennessee could choose to tax themselves to pay for public transit. In case that bill does not pass, we thought we would pick out some of the more important parts and have them available uh, in the future to run that bill should we need it. And so really what that does is allows us the option sometime down the road, probably a month or two, to have a bill that would allow for local option taxes for the Middle Tennessee counties. And so there's the gas tax, which is proposal by the governor, that would help fund a lot of the backlog projects. And that is a distinct funding source from, from the bill that we talked about earlier, the one that would be the local option. But they really do uh, work together well. They're sort of married together. You don't want to have infrastructure improvements outside of Middle Tennessee and then have it all gummed up when you get to, to our county line, for example. Conversely, if we really improve the, the transit in Middle Tennessee, and as soon as you get out of that area, you can't get from here to Memphis, you, you really shot yourself in the foot in that regard. Joining me now is the new Republican leader of the House, Representative Glenn Cassida from Franklin. It's good to see you again, and congratulations Jim. on your promotion. Thank you, Chip. Good to be. Thank you for having me back. I had to start with something uncomfortable, but yes. the elephant in the House, Representative Lovell resigned reportedly for improper conduct with a woman. Yes. He claims he's innocent, but he yes. resigned. Speaker Harwell says that's it because he resigned. Yes. Yes. Or is there an investigation? Will there be an investigation? What's going on? With the uh, the ethics committee did did do an investigation, and they found that there was violations. Uh, but it had to stop there because he is now a private citizen, and so we don't want the legislature in in investigating private citizens. So with his resignation, and and to his defense, he would claim nothing happened, uh, and I'm resigning because of work responsibilities, family responsibilities, and uh, and so that's where it, where it will end. But it's followed up from years past, there's been other issues, and of course, uh, the Speaker of the House, Harwell, put together a commission yes. to study this and put together a new plan and update yes. the sexual harassment policy yes. that includes a video. Yes. How much participation has happened yes. within the Senate and the House, specifically the House? In the House, as of Monday morning, all Republicans had seen the video, and uh, I think only two or three on the Democratic side had not. So participation is well, well in the high 90s, and, and that's good. That's good. It's, just, it, it's about being aware. It's about being cognizant of your behavior. And, uh, and so I applaud the speaker for implementing this. The governor's gas tax. Yes. Tell us about that situation now and, and where that's progressing to. I, I would say of the 99 House members, probably 95 think that we need to do something. Uh, it's healthy to have debate. Now, the governor's pr put forward a proposal. Uh, a couple of House members have proposals. The subcommittee will debate that tomorrow, and a proposal will move out. And it is, it's good for the democratic process, it's good for the fiscal well-being of the state to debate it and come up with something. I like the governor's plan. Uh, it's my second pick, is the governor's plan. Uh, but I do like Representative David Hawke's plan. His plan simply says we're going to capture a quarter of a point from sales tax and give it to TDOT every year and build roads 
of what he claims as a much more stable revenue source is sales tax revenue, uh, gasoline with, uh, with electric vehicles, with alternative fuels, uh, with increased gas mileage on automobiles. Uh, Dave, Representative Hawk argues that the gas is not a dependable source, uh, where sales tax is. Seems like the different proposals that are coming up here are all trying to give local governments more control yes. over how they spend the money and how they raise money. Yes. That's their part of the contribution. Yes. Is that included in most of them that you've seen? It is. Uh, and in conjunction with that thought is a Representative Gerald McCormick out of Chattanooga has introduced a bill uh, that it stands alone, it's independent, that would allow locals via referendum to increase taxes upon themselves to fund their own transportation needs. And so uh, if for some reason something happens in one of the proposals, uh, uh, Representative McCormick, Chairman McCormick, uh, has something that will solve that. Other big issues that came up during the State of the State Address, uh, education was a big focus on that. The governor has had several different things that he's done over his years in office yes. that have changed education in Tennessee. Yes. What are some of the biggest things you saw in, in his proposal? You know, what he's got this year uh, is, is uh, he is fully funding BEP, so it's a tune of 415 million new dollars going to education. And, and Tennessee in the last couple of years have gone from 47th in our testing, and our NAEP testing, to on fourth grade social studies, we're now 18th. And so uh, under the governor's leadership, our testing has improved anywhere from 32nd to 18th in the nation, a far cry from what it was just six years ago at 47th. And so we are making great strides in education. Also continuing education, uh, adult education. Yes, yes. Um, one of the proposals is that nobody in Tennessee pays for community college. Yes, yes. How, how does that get funded? And, and more importantly, neither does the taxpayer. Uh, the lottery is doing well, and so we take the proceeds, the excess from the lottery funds and make it a last dollar scholarship for adults that want to go back to college. And, and, and I think this is yet again a, a, a sign that the governor's uh, higher ed drive to 55, it will go down as, as, as a leader in that. And, and that in turn will help Tennessee not only create more jobs, but increase uh, the wealth and increase personal prosperity of every Tennessean in this state. And part of educating people across the state of Tennessee is internet access. Yes. One of the governor's plans is to promote broadband access, yes, high speed broadband access yes. in some of the rural areas that don't have it now by yes. allowing some of the utilities and cooperatives to even reach beyond their boundaries to reach those areas. Yes, and I mean, let's face it, in, in the 60s, the intrastate road system was the mode of transportation, the mode of commerce. Uh, this this uh, broadband is the, is the interstate of our age. And if a community, if an individual wants to be successful in business, uh, in education, they've got to have broadband. And the governor is leading the charge on this. And, and, and I like what he's doing, is using cooperatives to lead the way into the rural areas where they're being underserved or not served at all. The Republican Leader of the House, Representative Glenn Cassida, thanks again for being on the show. If you've been to Nashville recently, you've noticed all the cranes around town as the state capitol enjoys a major construction boom. The blasting and hammering extends to Capitol Hill as well, as a new home is being renovated for the General Assembly to occupy later this year. After the 2017 session, work is scheduled to begin on the Capitol building as well. Here's more. Tennessee's General Assembly has called Legislative Plaza home for the past 35 years. But by late 2017, legislators will be on the move to new offices in a classic state building now under renovation. Cordell Hall is a very historic building. Uh, it's named after uh, a Secretary of State, uh, actually the longest serving Secretary of State under Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, it was built in the early 50s. Uh, I believe it was occupied in 1954. And so not a lot has actually been done to it during that period of time. So you'll see a large renovation project which is going on currently. Uh, the legislature, we believe, for the future needs to expand a bit. So we will be expanding and adding a hearing room here that they don't currently have and a few other, other features. So rather than keeping them where they were, uh, we thought the best idea for, for all of government is to have the legislature occupy this larger building. Renovation of Cordell Hall is ongoing and it will be connected to the Capitol by an astounding 450 foot tunnel. Uh, we're doing very little on the exterior because the limestone is still good, the roof is still good, but we are replacing the windows and every other feature literally on the inside of this building. So it's a very extensive renovation project for a 350,000 square foot building. 
Later this year, the Capitol itself is scheduled for a bit of a makeover, but just a little on the top. Yes, we have a project coming up for the state capitol. Uh, it's on the cupola. The cupola is, is really the structure that sits on top of, uh, I guess everybody would just see it, the green roof, the copper roof. The company chosen for the job is a firm well known for its Tennessee government landmarks. In fact, it's the same company that last refurbished the capitol's exterior in the 1950s. We have 300 days to do this project. We are not replacing the roof structurally what we're doing is taking the ornamental iron, which sits on top of the roof, it's anchored to the roof, but it's not part of the roof system. We're removing the roof system that we put on in the 50s, replacing boards that may be rotten that we discover are rotten, and then putting a new copper roof on top. When we get working on the cupola, we'll actually take it off. So we'll actually see the top come off. It's the ornamental iron work. All of that will actually be removed piece by piece and then sent away to be re uh, restored again. We'll actually remove the flagpole from up there. So all of that will come down as they do that structural work ag again to make sure that the, the iron work is all restored and that the interior is all restored again to make sure it lasts for decades to come. Hopefully we'll do many more in the next century. We've been working for a hundred years and looking forward to a hundred more years and uh, it's really a great honor to work on historic old buildings. Joining me now are Senator Brian Kelsey from Germantown and Representative Dennis Powers of Jacksboro. There are over 1,400 bills to consider this year, but you guys have an important resolution in front of the General Assembly that's pretty unique. How did this get started? And, and tell us more about what you're proposing. Yes, Chip, this uh, particular resolution is for the planning convention for a balanced budget amendment convention of the states, which we hope will happen this year or next year. Originally, we passed the resolution back in 2014. It was a call for the Article 5 convention under Article 5 of the Constitution. There's actually two different ways to amend the U.S. Constitution. One is for Congress to do it with two-thirds of Congress uh, calling for the convention, three-fourths to uh, ratify it. The same thing is true. The founders put it in the Constitution where the states can actually do that also. But you have to have two-thirds of the states or 34 and three-fourths of the states or 38 to ratify it. So we're at 28 now. We hope to get enough to have 34 by the end of the year and actually call a convention. This particular resolution is just for a planning or like a pre-convention to set up the rules for the Article 5 convention that we would be holding and the procedures for that. Now this is pretty rare. Uh, when it, was the last time this happened? Bill of Rights? It actually was 1861 was the last time that we had a convention of states and that was right before the Civil War. In an effort to stave off the Civil War, it obviously was unsuccessful and we hope that this one will be much more successful uh, this year. And so it, it really will be a great opportunity for Tennessee and for Nashville uh, to host this planning convention, uh, hopefully this summer, so that we can then plan for the future convention of states uh, to actually amend the Constitution. So during the planning session, I guess you're making up the rules as you go since this doesn't happen very often. Well, that's part of the uh, of the questions that we hope to answer, is what are the exact rules? Uh, what are the ways in which we want to vote on these things? Uh, traditionally, that's been by state, uh, but I think that it's gonna be very helpful to have a planning convention so that we can get those rules set, so we can make a recommendation as well to Congress as to when and where to call for the actual Article 5 convention so that we can hopefully finally pass a balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Now, if the balanced budget amendment gets passed, are there other things that could happen at this convention as well? For example, term limits, other things like that being thrown into this? No, we've actually uh, narrowed it down. We've had a narrow focus on only a balanced budget amendment. And that's one thing that we're doing, be doing during the planning convention is to set up and make sure that those rules are followed and that we narrow it down just to only that one subject. So there's no chance for a runaway convention. We're only going to deal with one subject. I've, I've seen a little bit on this and in, in, uh, covered in the press and uh, it just kind of hit me that this is such a monumental thing that you guys are putting together. Uh, do you, th is, the, is the momentum going to build on this or do you try to keep it low until you have the votes? What's the strategy? Well, I think it'll be, a, you're right, it will be a historic event, especially for, not only for our country, for the state of Tennessee. And we have a broad range of support. For example, Wyoming just passed it earlier this year in their house and so we have them now it's one of the 28 states and we have support all across the, the state. So 
a lot of it depends on when a state legislature, when they're actually in session and they can pass it in their house or in, in Senate both. So a lot of that depends, it's kind of a timing type thing. We hope to get to the 34 by the end of this year, if not by next year, but the momentum has been building over the past three or four years. And Chip, you know, the, our debt was last paid off when Andrew Jackson was in the White House. Mm -hmm. So it does make perfect sense that, it, that Tennessee would be on the forefront of this issue once again. Representative Powers, Senator Kelsey, thanks for joining us on the show. We're gonna be following this issue. That's all the time we have for today, but if you watch us again on the web, all of our shows are posted on YouTube the next day. Just search for Tennessee Capital Report or visit the website of your local public television station later this week. Thanks for joining us on the show. We'll see you again March 26th for another legislative wrap-up here on Tennessee Public Television. I'm Chip Hoback. Tennessee Capital Report is made possible in part by a grant from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Tennessee. Some games aren't played for glory. Some are played for more important reasons. That's why we partner with schools to re-energize physical education with Shape the State. With additional support from the following members of the Tennessee Credit Union League,